Justin, thanks so much, man. Thank you. Real quick before I forget, kids, you're dismissed. Children's Church. Justin, thank you for Christ-centered songs. Thank you. Thank you for um, everything pointing to Jesus and who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And that line in the last song you did, My Shepherd, Your Loving Kindness Found Me Where I Am. That about sums it up. That's about... Right, that's perfect. So thank you, Justin, so much. Well, good morning, guys. Let's, let's go back to the story of Gideon from the book of Judges, this book that we've been going through. If you remember in chapter 6, um, Israel does it again, right? They um, have had 40 years of rest and peace after the delivering ministry of Deborah and Barak, and after 40 years, they fall again. They turn to other gods again. Remember, they don't fully abandon the worship of God, but they do what is in effect the same thing. They mix the worship of God with the worship of other gods. And so God raises up again a foreign oppressor. This time it's Midian that comes to bring Israel back to their senses. But God, before he sends them a deliverer, because after seven years of oppression from Midian, they cry out again. And before he sends a deliverer this time, he sends a prophet because he wants to break the cycle in Israel to help them understand why this keeps happening to them. Not just that it does, but why. But they don't repent. And so God raises up a deliverer again. He raises up an extremely unlikely, unable man named Gideon who is hiding in a wine press threshing wheat when the angel of the Lord first speaks to him. And so all through chapter 6 is this conversation more or less between the angel of the Lord and Gideon. And Gideon gets progressively more ready and he has questions and he has fears, but God steals him and helps him and moves him forward. And that brings us to chapter one or to chapter seven, verse one. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, remember they changed his name because he tore down the Asherah pole and the altar. So they called him Jeroboam, let Baal contend with him. Remember Gideon's dad came out and said, no, 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 you're not gonna kill my son. If Baal's God, let him stand up for himself. So the people changed his name to Jeroboam, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Harod. And the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. So Gideon is preparing now. Remember, he's blown the trumpet to fight against the Midianites. And in 633, we found it's not just technically the Midianites, but the Amalekites, another Canaanite tribe. And then it says the people of the east. There's just a huge force arrayed against him. So Gideon is there with his people waiting to see what God will say next. So let's look. Verse 2. The Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. Now that line sets the entire passage, the whole story, in a very specific context. God has just said to Gideon, you have too many soldiers. Now keep in mind, there are three nations for all intents and purposes, camped out in the valley of Jezreel. We need as many soldiers as we can get. Why is God saying this? Why are there too many? Continuing the verse, lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved me. In other words, there are too many people for God alone to get the glory for the victory over the Midianites. If they go to war like this with 32,000, Israel can say they were the reason for the victory. We did it. We had something to do with it. And God doesn't want that. And that's the whole point of the story. Israel has to know that the glory for salvation belongs to God alone. Verse 3. God is speaking again. He says, Now therefore, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. So the first thing God does is weed out all the soldiers that are willing to admit publicly that they're too afraid to fight. That's what he's doing. Now he's going to weed out the rest. Verse 4. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. 
For what? You've lost 22,000 men and 10,000 is still too many? Yes, the people are still too many for the victory to be credited to God alone. And remember, that's the whole point. The middle of verse 4, take them down to the water and I will test them for you there. And anyone of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And anyone of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. Verse 5, so he brought the people down to the water and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand and let all the others go, every man to his own home. Now, Gideon started the day with 32,000 soldiers and now there are 300. He has lost 99% of his army. Now, we're going to come back to this later because it's such a central thing in the text, but we may have to be willing to give up a bit of a sacred cow here, take it out back and slaughter it. There's nothing in this text, nothing that says Gideon is supposed to keep these 300, by, 300 guys because the way they drink water shows that they're really soldiers. You know, did God say, Gideon, keep the 300 guys who stayed alert while they drank? I only want the best. The test at the water was to weed out more of their number, not to find out who the best soldiers were. God wants to destroy any sense of Israel being able to have confidence in fighting men. That's what he's doing. Why they drank the way they did has nothing to do with it. It's not in the text anyway. The fact is it's now Gideon and 300 guys against Midian, the Amalekites, and the people of the east. So by the time we get here in the passage, the only explanation that honors the context and is consistent with it for keeping the 300 who lapped is that those 300 will in no way compromise the idea of credit for the victory being given to God alone. That's why they're here. 300 skilled fighting men could lessen the victory that, or the glory that goes to God. So that's not why they're here. And they're not going to fight anyway. It doesn't matter what skill they have. Verse 8. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets. And he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the 300 men. And the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. That same night the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down... Go down with, to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterwards your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. <clears throat> so the fear and the weakness of Gideon and Israel run all through the text. And even in all this, God, knowing that Gideon's afraid, gives him something miraculous again to strengthen his spirit. So God isn't harsh with Gideon because Gideon trembles. The middle of verse 11. Then he went down with <clears throat> Purah, his servant. So he was afraid to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. 12. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance. And their camels were without number as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. That's an editorial note from the author to remind us, yeah, we need more men. 300 is not going to be enough. Verse 13, when Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade. And he said, behold, I dreamed a dream. And behold, a cake of barley bread. That's it. Okay, maybe, maybe this big. A cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian, came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, this is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. God brought him to that tent at that moment. Verse 15, as soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshiped and he returned to the camp of Israel and said, arise for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. Is there any conversation in all of Midian that night that would have been better for Gideon to hear 
But to show up at the tent at that moment and hear this dream that this guy had and the interpretation of it from another Midianite. God was true in verse 11. Gideon is strengthened to go down into the camp, but think about what it took to get to this moment for him. Because we have the separation of two weeks here. Gideon needed an angel, the angel of the Lord, to burn up his offering. Right? He needed two miraculous fleece episodes, and he needed this miraculous dream and its interpretation. It is so hard to trust God, no matter what he says to us. Gideon is very weak. So in other words, God has picked a man that will not steal the glory for victory from him. Verse 16, and he divided, Gideon divided the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Now, I love that Gideon is ready now. I mean, think about what he's saying. If, if, if the Midianites have heard, obviously, that there's this man named Gideon that's leading Israel. So when the shout goes up, if they hear that name, it's going to shake them. But try to keep the actual realistic picture of what's going on in your head. These 300 guys with Gideon look down into the valley, and you know what they see. Camels you can't count. Soldiers like locusts. Imagine that. And there's 300 of you, and your leader comes to you and says, listen, here's what we're going to do to beat this army. We're going to divide into three groups of like 100 guys. I want everybody to get a trumpet and a jar and a torch. And when I blow on mine, you guys all blow on yours, and we smash the jars, and we, we shout. Now, who do you think was the first guy? Was like, now, do we, do we get swords? or No? Okay. All right. All right. I'm just and getting this. No, 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 dude. It's, it's foolproof. It's foolproof. Let's trust me. Verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch when they had just set the watch. So Midian, there's four watches in the night. There are about two watches in, obviously, the middle of the night. So the new watch is just waking up, coming on. The old watch is very groggy, coming back tired. So you have two forces going at each other like this. Middle of verse 19, and they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried out a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Now, I know I was trying to be a little bit funny earlier, but if, if, if that strategy was anything, it would have been confusing given what was going on in the moment. Now, it won't win the battle, though. Right? It, it, let's say that the 300 guys in the middle of all that confusion are able to kill three or four hundred soldiers. In the, what difference does that make? Because some of you are going to die in that, and then you have the entire Midianite army that's going to regroup after a couple minutes. So this is not what wins the battle. It would have just messed everybody up for a few minutes. Verse 21, every man stood in his place around the camp, and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. When they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set Every man's sword against his comrade and against all the enemy because you don't win battles with trumpets and jars. This story, when it got told, was meant to evoke a certain kind of response. It's meant for us to say, for any that would have heard it in Israel, how in the world did they win that battle? They beat people over the head with their trumpets. What did they do? They won because God was fighting. God did this. The soldiers going out to watch are meeting the soldiers coming in for watch. They're armed. They're confused. The Lord set them against each other. So that wasn't going to happen naturally. Notice that. God didn't sit back and just let that happen. No, no, no. He made that happen. The Lord set them all against each other, and they start fighting and killing each other. It was God that did that. It's very important. In the middle of verse 22, and the army fled as far as Beth Shittah towards Zerera, as far as the border of Abel Mahola by Tabath. And the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from all Manasseh, and they pursued after Midian. 
Gideon sent messengers throughout all the hill country of Ephraim saying, come down against the Midianites and capture the waters against them as far as Beth Barah and also the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were called out and they captured the waters as far as Beth Barah and also the Jordan. And they captured the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. Then they pursued Midian and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon across the Jordan. That victory belongs to God alone. Not a single Israelite soldier with Gideon killed a single Midianite in that initial battle. Not one. They just pursued. So God won that victory completely. That's a cool story. It's a cool story. Why has God's Holy Spirit told it to us. And I think there are four truths we can take from this passage, from this story that probably most of us know from Sunday school on about Gideon and his jars and his trumpets and his torches. The first one is this. Our performance is not what matters most to God. Our performance is not what matters most to God. God consistently calls the weak, the untalented, the unequipped all the time. Why? Why does God call whom he calls? Why doesn't God use the best person for the job? That's normal, earthly business practice. It just makes sense. Use the best person for the job, right? Don't call in a mechanic to do a plumbing job or whatever, however you want to break that down. Use the best person for the job. But God doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, God says that his power is made perfect in weakness. That is, God's power is most clearly revealed in our weakness. Why does everybody try to be strong then? Why is self-improvement to a level of strength, why is that everybody's goal? Why are we all trying so hard to be strong? God can make whatever outcome he wants. He's not at the mercy of our performance, ever. So just as a matter of necessity to getting a job done, he doesn't need to call the best person for the job. He could. I mean, he could, right? He could make things go much quicker, much easier. But we have this whole thing here with the trumpets and the jars. Look, 32,000 against probably at least 100,000 is still makes Israel quite the underdog. I mean, it's not like all the glory is going to be robbed from God. They obviously would have needed his help to get it done. And I mean, God, listen, God could have raised up and equipped 32,000 Davids. David was a bad man. Benaiah, remember Benaiah, one of his men of valor? He hopped down into a, a, a pit in the middle of winter and killed a lion with a staff. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm not, I'm not jumping down in a pit in the middle of winter with an animal. If, if it's a badger, I'm not jumping down there. Or a little, badgers are pretty mean. I, if it's a little, my little chihuahua who is a shepherd for the devil, I'm telling you. I'm not jumping down in the little pit with him. God could have made 32,000 men into amazing warriors. The Israeli army to this day is no joke. My father-in-law was a, a, a Green Beret, and I asked him one time, who are the best special forces on the planet, in your opinion? He didn't even blink. He said, oh, the Mossad, the Israelis. Not even close. He said, second, us. Third, the British, you know, he just, Israel, I mean, these aren't, these aren't like in, unable fighting men. And God could have made them in the moment, filled them with the power to be amazing warriors. But Israel winning wasn't the point. It wasn't the point. It, it wasn't about them showing how great of an army they were. God wasn't working to exalt Israel. Listen, God is not obsessed with our image. We are. His goal is not our glory. We get the salvation. God gets the glory. 
God doesn't choose the weak and the foolish things of the world to make much of the weak and foolish things of the world. If you take pride in being weak instead of being strong, you're still filled with pride. He chooses the weak and foolish things of the world to make much of himself. Beloved, the goal of our Christian life is not to look good. It's to make much of Jesus. I want to say that again. The goal of our Christian life is not to look good. It's to make much of Jesus. The more weak, the more ill-equipped, the more unlikely you are, the more likely you'll be able to make much of Jesus. Our ability to glorify God then is tied directly to our weakness, not our strength. Our ability to glorify God is tied directly to our weakness, not to our strength. God isn't sweating the results in everything. We are. He has other reasons for working, namely his glory. So we have to find a way, if that's the right way to say it, to let our light shine so that by seeing our good works, they give glory to God in heaven and not to us. And if we're obsessed with our performance, we will not be able to help being obsessed with the glory for it. If you live by the ability of your performance to make you good enough for God or good enough for people, then you will die on the altar of frustration and rejection. And Jesus Christ has paid it all. So you don't need to be great. You need to show that Jesus is. Your Christian life is not about behavior. Jesus died precisely because our behavior will never be good enough to make much of God. We won't glorify God even with our best. So he saves us by grace and pays all of it for us. in saving us because we couldn't measure up and because we don't deserve it. And in spite of our poor performance, all the glory and salvation then goes to the Savior and not the save. God did not thin out that army to make much of Jewish valor. He thinned out that army so that the glory for salvation would go to him alone. And he has saved you and me. He has won our victory so that the glory for our salvation would go to him alone from start to finish. It's not like God gets the glory for the beginning and then you carry the torch to the end. God does it. You're saved by grace from the beginning to the end and all the glory is his. So our performance is not what matters most to God. The second thing, it is human nature to think our performance matters most to God. It is human nature to think our performance matters most to God. Go back up, if you would, to verse 2. The Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved me. So 32,000 people, they would have boasted. If there is a millimeter a millimeter of opportunity for us to take credit for something, we will. It is human nature to find some way to give ourselves the credit and give ourselves the glory, even if it's just a little bit. If there's the tiniest opportunity to boast in our work, we will. Now that even shows in how we interpret the Bible sometimes. In verses four to eight, God thins out Gideon's army the rest of the way. Now, All my life, any time I've ever heard this story, honestly, I don't think I'm overstating it. I think every single time I've ever heard this story referenced, I've heard the text interpreted something like this. So the 9,700 of the 10,000 left who knelt down to drink water, they were no soldiers. A true soldier knows that you lay down and lap the water because you're in a hurry You just get down there, you get it, and you go. You need to be keeping your eyes out. Keep your eyes on the enemy. So the kneelers, they were careless. They weren't fit for battle. The 300, they're the real soldiers. So send all the other ones away and keep the real, keep the best, keep the committed. Let me read to you, illustrating this from a commentary on judges. (coughs) Excuse me. 
This is from a commentary. God saw how untrustworthy would be those thousands who carelessly indulged under the lure of the flesh over against the 300 who exemplified a spirit of vigilance and disciplined life in the spirit. Okay. Thus were selected the strong and resolute, the men who could be trusted under rigorous conditions, those who did not think of themselves before the enemy's unexpected assault. This is ever the divine principle of selection for service. God only picks the best. This is ever the divine principle of selection for service. As Gideon, so the church in this day is served well by the minority group, ready and vigilant. Now that sounds very nice. That is a great way to make yourself and your performance the center of that text. The problem is that that isn't in the text at all. It doesn't even fit with what has been said in the least. The text doesn't even hint at how you draw water showing any skill or virtue or lack of it. None whatsoever. This scene is here because God wanted to reduce Gideon's army. We know that. So these 300 then are the emblem of Israel's weakness, not the epitome of her strength. They're here so that Israel cannot say, my hand has saved me. Think about that. So if there are 300 of the best soldiers in Israel, and with 300 they defeat the whole army, they're not, you're not going to be able to brag about that? Putting the attention on the quality of the 300 left turns the whole point of this text on its head, completely flips it out of context. Good soldiers are capable of some pretty amazing things. They really are. I mean, we, even 300 against a massive army. We know a story. Most of us probably know. We've heard of 300 before, before that goofy movie came out. There's another story about 300 soldiers. Remember the 300 Spartans at Thermopylae, the Persians at Thermopylae? 300 some Spartans killed at least 20,000 Persians because they were incredible soldiers. That's why we talk about them. Because 300 soldiers defeating a massive army, we are going to heap glory and praise on them and respect them and brag about them apparently thousands of years later because that's an amazing story. So, the number 300 does not automatically rule out the notion of Israel saying, my hand has saved me, especially if those 300 left are the best soldiers in Israel or great soldiers. No, these 300 have to be completely unequipped to fight if God's desire for leaving that many is to be achieved. God knew Israel's nature. He knows our nature because of the tendency of God's people to this day to glorify their own efforts and trust their own proven methods and credit their own contributions and think highly of their cleverness, God reduced Israel to absolute helplessness. Absolute helplessness. So that the only thing they can say when it's all said and done is, God saved us. Beloved, we want the Christian life to be all about us and our improvement and our performance, and it isn't. Some of us are so consumed as Christians with how we look that we rob the glory from God every time we do something right. All boasting is antichrist. All of it and any of it, from 1% to 100 The greatest spiritual danger to you and I is not Hollywood. <clears throat> it's not secular music. This is not a call to not be discerning, by the way. Please don't make it easy to toss that in the trash by saying something I'm not. I'm saying that the greatest threat to us spiritually, the greatest danger is not Hollywood. It's not secular music. It's not Disney. It's not the liberals. It's not ISIS. It's not homosexuals, 
It's not whether you drink. It's not whether you smoke. The greatest spiritual danger is believing that you got saved or stay saved because of your own performance. Beloved, it is more than possible, even likely, that God actually means to do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to make sure that the credit and the glory for whatever you are and whatever you have and whatever you do all goes to him. Some of us need to repent for trying to be so perfect and give glory to God. Oh, I do, Tony. I do. What are you talking about? I give all the glory to God for what I am. Right? I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers. This is Jesus speaking in Luke 18. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Two men went down to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee lifted his face up to heaven. You know, he prays, Lord, I thank you. He gives credit to God for his righteousness. I thank you that I'm not like other people. You know, the, the, the people who do see R-rated movies, people who don't pray every time before they eat. I thank you that I'm not like those people. People like that tax collector over there. Yet, hey, Tony, there but for the grace of God go I. While Jesus says in Luke 18 that the one who goes down to his house justified is the one who can't even look up to heaven but beats on his chest and says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's not about conversion. That's a parable about the attitude of your heart. Jesus puts it in context. He said this to those who were wishing to justify themselves with their righteousness. We can play with Jesus' words there until it dies the death of a thousand qualifications or we can stop trying to look so righteous that it looks like we don't really need Jesus. We're pulling this off because we're such a good person. It is only when we understand how big our debt actually is that we can ever be rightly thankful for God having paid it. You don't know how much he loves you until you know how weak you are. That whether you read your Bible and pray this morning or not, his love is not increased or lessened. And read your Bible and pray every morning. That's not what I'm saying. But please don't think it's what matters and makes God like you a little bit more. Please. We want so badly to be affirmed and praised and satisfied. We want that so badly. God, look what I did for you. Look what I did. Look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. In our DNA, we are wired to think our performance is what matters most to God, and it isn't. And that brings us to the third thing from this text and why we have said what we've said. God's glory matters most to God. God's glory matters most to God. The ultimate goal of God, and I, I don't, that, that is not a, 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 like a, a doctrinal stretch of any kind, I think the authority to say that comes exclusively from what's in the Bible. The ultimate goal of God in everything God does, from existing to creating a universe, to the exodus, to the cross, to saving sinners, to coming again, and everything in between, in, in between is the glory of God. That's the goal of God in all of those things, in everything that exists or has ever been made. From the first angel to the last human being is all on purpose by God for God's glory. All of it. That's God's answer when you look to why he's ultimately involved in anything every single time. For my glory. We're just going to consider that this morning from this text. But if you were to survey the Bible, and I'm begging you to, I'm encouraging you to, for the times when God reveals his ultimate reason for doing anything, you'll see it over and over and over and over again. It is staggering 
Phrases like, for my glory, for the sake of my name, that I would be glorified. The greatest heart in the universe for God's glory is God's heart. Judges 7.2, what's the whole point? Lest Israel boast over me. God is saying, no, I do not want that. Nobody's going to be boasting over me. Nobody's going to get the glory here but me. And why would that have been bad? I mean, would it have been so bad if a little bit of credit went to the people? A little bit? I mean, how needy is God? That'd be the only explanation for him acting this way. Maybe there's another, but we'll come to that. Why? Why does this matter so much? What's the big deal? Because, beloved, God wants all the glory. 99.9% is not enough for majestic, unending, infinite beauty. Only 100% will do. Only 100% will do. So God moves to ensure that's what happens. That's the whole point of him working in Judges 7. There are other points under that, saving Israel, but the ultimate one is God's glory. Isaiah 48, one example, 9 through 11. Listen to the God-centeredness of God in this passage. For my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. Can we boast in what we suffer? Because we made it through? Well, why did God put us, put Israel in context, in the furnace of affliction? For my own sake. For my own sake, I do it. He says it twice. For how should my name be profaned? My glory, I will not give to another. Won't happen. So the main thing Israel needed to know <clears throat> was that glory for salvation belongs to God alone, and we're powerless to achieve it ourselves. That theme is proclaimed in the Bible over and over and over again because human nature cannot let go of its incessant need to save itself not just because we honor hard work, but because we love the glory for it. And God, in the whole work of moving toward us to save us at all, his main thing he's doing in man, in people, he says this in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved. You know this text. Through faith, and this is not your own doing. So just in case you wanted to take credit for the faith, that 0.1%, God says, nope, you didn't do that either. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. Why? So that no one may boast. He doesn't change. The war down in the valley of your heart will be won by the grace of God, not the value of your performance before or after salvation. And the life of goodness that you've been created to walk in, in Ephesians 2.10, flows out of grace and is because of grace and is the fruit of grace and doesn't have anything to do with you earning it or achieving it. Everything God does, every act of his in our lives, every work of the Spirit is done with a view ultimately to his glory, not ours. Now, that probably sounds unloving. Probably sounds needy and selfish because we get a picture in our head of like a, a person on Facebook. Me, 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 like me. Make much of me. Here's my face for no reason whatsoever. Right? Me, 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 me. Who? Oh, praise me. Like me. Love me. Follow me. Support me. Respect me. Listen to me. Hear me. My opinions are valid. My opinions are great. Me, 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 me. 
So when we hear he does everything for his own glory, we start thinking, wait, 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 wait. I mean, we should be the reason God does anything. That's why we think he's so good. Because he's good to us. If he wasn't, he wouldn't be good. We won't say that out loud, but... That brings us to the last point, point four. All of this comes together for us to say this. God's greatest desire to be glorified and our greatest desire to be satisfied is what we're always after at the end of the day. God's greatest desire to be glorified, my greatest desire to be satisfied, meet in worship. God gives us himself as the ultimate prize in salvation, doesn't he? When all of this is said and done, what do we get? Him. Eternal life is not a hall of mirrors. Romans 15, 8 and 9. Again, we start looking for what, what is the ultimate reason? What were you doing here? It's even the answer in John 3, 16. Romans 15, 8 and 9, Jesus became a servant to the circumcised, came to earth as a Jewish man in Palestine to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs, so it's clear that he keeps his word, and so that the Gentiles would glorify God for his mercy. It's not bad for us then that God does everything everything ultimately for his own glory. If that's not why God moves, Israel never leaves Egypt. Why did he bring them out? To make his name great among the nations. They benefited pretty well from God being after his own glory, didn't they? It's not bad for us if God does everything ultimately for his own glory, and it isn't unloving. It isn't unloving. Now, if we tried to love like that, if we try to show our love for other people by exalting ourselves for them to enjoy, that would be unloving. Because we're not the best thing in the universe. So that'd be pretty selfish if I tried to love you that way. But if God is the most amazing thing in the universe, and in salvation, what he gives me is himself, then saving me for his glory is not selfish. It's the most loving thing he could ever do for me. If God is the only thing that can satisfy my soul, and in salvation he gives me something other than himself forever, you know, I, like here, I'm, I'm gonna save you, and so here's a bunch of money at the end. Here's the applause of other people at the end. I don't need, I don't, that's, but but we, that's not going to satisfy my soul. So then I would say, well, well maybe he doesn't love me. Like, like, why would he withhold the best from me? And he doesn't. Re I mean, listen to the Psalms, how they talk about him. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy at your right hand. And not because the streets are golden, are pleasures forevermore. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth I desire beside you. As the deer pants after water, so my soul longs after you. You satisfy me. You cause me to drink from the river of your delights. Then Jesus comes, and how does he talk? You don't want to die. You don't want to lose everything. You want to be satisfied. You want to stop being thirsty. You want to stop being hungry. Have me. Glorifying himself, lifting up himself that I might be satisfied. God exalting himself for my enjoyment and salvation is the most loving thing he can do because only he is that beautiful and that glorious. Only him. There's nobody like him. I love that, I love that song, Justin, my shepherd. I love that. 
You satisfy even when I dream. More than anything, God desires to be glorified. More than anything, let's be honest, I desire to be satisfied. Those are the two great longings in the universe. And worship is where they meet and become one. The worship of God is where they meet and become one because all sin is seeking to be satisfied in anything and everything but him. Romans 1 takes all of it, no matter what it is, from disobedience to parents to brazen, blatant homosexuality, puts it all in one group and says, you all worship other gods. That's why you do everything you do. I didn't create you to not be satisfied. I created you to be satisfied in me and you keep drinking trash. Jesus is my Gideon. That's why I worship him. Jesus became foolish and weak to destroy my enemies so that I could come back home to my father. So in my salvation, his desire to be glorified is met when the purpose of my existence becomes the glory of his name for saving me and my desire to be satisfied is met because in him, my search for satisfaction is over. And Jesus has become eternal bread and living water for my soul. I am satisfied and God is glorified because he is what satisfies me. Let go of the need to be great and let Jesus be great. Get him as high as you can. Let him start making everything else in your life actually look like what it is so that you can actually love the people in your life and serve the people in your life without needing anything from him because Jesus is everything. There's so much more I could say, but I'm gonna close. To be perfectly honest with you, with all my heart, I'd like to have Justin sing again Bring us before the Father once more. Actually, Jesus did that. But just help us focus. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much once more for who you are. Your loving kindness found me. That's, that's the only reason I'm here. There is no, nothing I had got me to this pulpit. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing that I have got me my wife or my kids or anything good that I've ever had. You provide everything. You are everything. Everything's a ray pointing back to the sun in my life. So Lord, would you be glorified now as we sing, as we close this out? Would you open our hearts? Would you speak to us? Would you have your way? Send us into this week with hope and joy and peace and desire for you. Wean us off the world. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. And if you have any questions about today's recording, Gateway Church, or what it means to follow Jesus Christ, you can reach us through the contact section of our website, gwbrawley.org.